Recently I had a discussion in Skype with this young lady who goes by the name Sophia Ruin in YouTube. It turned into one about evolution and creation. She's an evolutionist. I explained to her that one of the problems with the idea that random genetic mutation has developed in the genome of all the life forms of the earth and is the stuff of life for evolution is the fact that we have discovered that genes are often overlapping and embedded and that when a random genetic mutation affects one gene there's a good chance it will affect yet another and possibly even yet another. This causes a compounding of the degradatory effect of genetic mutation on life forms and is verification that random genetic mutation cannot be the stuff of life as evolutionists claim. But being the evolutionist that she is she says no 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 genes are red linear they don't overlap and they're not embedded. Well Sophia you're behind. Genes are indeed overlapping and embedded. As time goes on we will continue to discover more and more and more of these overlapping and embedded genes. So far we've discovered hundreds before we're through, we may be dis discover many thousands. It's hard to say at this point. But the point is that random genetic mutations are degradatory to the code of the DNA molecule. And overlapping and embedded genes is one of the reasons they are so degradatory. Because a random genetic mutation which occurs to one gene very well may affect another, or another, and another, or another and another and another. Geneticists today are shying away from the use of the word gene because it really doesn't properly describe what we observe in the genome of life. The preferred term is sequences because it's difficult to say what code ends where and starts where in some cases because genes these sequences are overlapping and embedded so much and as we continue to study the genome we continue to discover more and more genes which are overlapping and or embedded. This is a great problem for evolutionists and their crazy claim that random genetic mutation is what has developed the genomes of all the life forms in the world and is the stuff of life that has caused its diversity. Now why did Sophia deny that genes were overlapping and embedded? Well firstly she was ignorant of this fact and secondly because it is a mode of operation for evolutionists to attempt to downplay the stupefying complexity of the cell and of genetics, the DNA molecule. They do this because the complexity and interdependence of the cell and DNA and the information characteristics and language characteristics of DNA fly completely in the face of the evolutionists beliefs. So is common. Evolutionists attempt to downplay or deny the stupefying complexity, interdependence, and language characteristics of DNA that we've discovered in the last couple of decades. Because they know in their mind that this complexity, interdependence, and language characteristics of DNA is something that nature simply could never have produced. It's not even rational to think so. But for evolutionists, evolutionism is not about science or what science demonstrates. It's about where their heart is. And so they're willing to deny science and downplay everything we've learned about genetics and the cell in the last 30 years in order to keep their paradigm alive, especially within their own mind, so their conscience can seemingly be justifiable. This paper from Genome Research discusses mammalian overlapping genes, the comparative perspective between human and mouse genomes. According to this paper, thus far are discovered 774 genes overlapping in the human genome and 542 genes overlapping exons in the human genome, compared to 578 genes which are overlapping in the mouse genome and 455 genes with overlapping exons in the mouse genome. Notice the difference in the number of overlapping genes. The discovery of overlapping genes is just in its infancy. As time goes on, we continue to discover more and more genes which are overlapping 
or embedded or both from the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in the United States an illustration describing overlapping genes here we see that this gene starts and ends here and within that gene is this other gene which starts and ends within it this is a fully embedded gene here's another example of overlapping genes in head-to-head -head gene pairs notice the overlapping segment of the gene that means that the base pairs which make up this gene also make up this gene they're shared not just on opposite strands of the DNA but also overlapping genes occur on the same strand here's an illustration of overlapping and embedded genes this gene possesses this gene within it fully embedded and it overlaps this gene which has this gene embedded within it one of the claims of evolutionists is that random genetic mutations not only developed the human genome but the genomes of all other life forms but it is the stuff of life that random genetic mutation is what has created all of the information which defines all of the structures and functions of life forms this is completely preposterous genetic mutations are degradatory to the genome I've been telling evolutionists this for the longest they refuse to listen and many of them don't believe you when you tell them this illustration demonstrates why all genetic mutations cause degradatory effects to the genomes code because if a random genetic mutation which affects this portion of the gene takes place it will affect this gene so even if we were to find that a genetic mutation provided some imagined benefit or observable benefit to this gene which is exceedingly rare it is almost certain that it would cause degradatory effects to this one and it's possible that if a random genetic mutation occurred to this portion of this gene it would also cause degradatory effects to this gene and perhaps even this gene because genes are overlapping and embedded random genetic mutations typically affect more than one gene at a time and the result is accruing damage to the genome no matter how you slice it random genetic mutations are degradatory to the code of the genome they cannot be seen as beneficial they are always negative so the next time an evolutionist repeats this tired dead ancient mantra to you that random mutation has not only developed the genomes of all the life forms in the world but created the information which defines their structures and chemical processes tell them about overlapping and embedded genes and point them to this video God forbid you should tell them that DNA conforms to linguistics law more advanced than ZIFs possesses the language characteristics of syntax of punctuation and grammar or that it's code and that it's an information storage medium you're liable to make their head explode from a denialism overload because you know evolutionists hate science they're the enemies of science everything that they spout is anti-science and denial of science don't be too hard on them it's not their head talking it's their heart and now a few select moments from a lecture by a geneticist and a substitution mutation could be considered to be analogous to a misspelling if you will it, when you're dealing with a human language and so a mutation essentially changes a substitution mut mutation changes the DNA sequence that would comprise a gene so let's say you have a, an A at a particular position that A let's say gets changed with a, a substituted and replaced by a G now you have a mutation you have a change in that sequence and it turns out that when that happens 
the codon that that A is part of is now going to be a different codon because you replace the A with the G now. It's a now a new coding triplet. And that means that it could potentially specify a different amino acid. If it specifies a different amino acid, that means the amino acid sequence now that's used to build that protein is going to be altered. And because amino acid sequences dictate the structural folding of that protein chain, the chain may, may fold in a different manner. And, it, and, and if it folds in, a, in an improper manner, it's going to compromise the function of the protein. And a substitution mutation could be considered to be analogous to a misspelling, if you will, it, when you're dealing with a human language. And so a mutation essentially changes, a substitution mut mutation changes the DNA sequence that would comprise a gene. So let's say you have a, an A at a particular position. That A, let's say, gets changed with a, a substituted and replaced by a G. Now you have a mutation. You have a change in that sequence. And it turns out that when that happens, the codon that that A is part of is now going to be a different codon because you replace the A with the G now. It's a now a new coding triplet. And that means that it could potentially specify a different amino acid. If it specifies a different amino acid, that means the amino acid sequence now that's used to build that protein is going to be altered. And because amino acid sequences dictate the structural folding of that protein chain, the chain may, may fold in a different manner and, it, and, and that if it folds in, a, in an improper manner, it's going to compromise the function of the protein. Now, in addition to that, there's something else that's quite intriguing. That DNA not only has the genetic code that's embedded into its structure, there is a whole host of other codes that operate independently of the genetic code that overlap with the code and carry out, again, critical functions, and they work in conjunction with the genetic code. So in other words, it's as if you had a sequence of, of, of letters, and the way in which you made sense of those letters was, again, through the use of a code that decoded that, that sequence and gave you meaningful information. But at the same time, you had another set of rules that could take that same sequence and give you a different set of, different set of information, and then another set of rules that could give you even a third set of information from the same sequence. To build a sequence that could harbor overlapping codes that would simultaneously communicate radically different things is incredibly amazing and would require an unbelievable amount of intelligent input to accomplish. And the, in addition to the genetic code, there's a number of other codes that you see built into the structure of DNA. Uh, I'm not going to go in, into the details. Uh, uh, I was going to talk a little bit about the histone binding code. I just want to kind of begin to wrap things up by pointing out that there's been some recent work done uh, that has actually showed that in addition to being optimized for error minimization capacity, the, 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 the genetic code that's in, found in nature is also optimized so that it can actually harbor multiple overlapping codes. So there's a different type of optimization that we observe uh, you know, for, the, for the genetic code as well. So what I basically have said here, and again, keep in mind this analogy between what humans do with regard to information and what we see in the cell's chemical systems. I've argued that biochemical systems are information systems and that there is a code that structures or organizes or gives meaning to that, that information both of which imply the work of an intelligent agent. This is our common experience. The genetic code displays remarkable optimization. That implies the work of an intelligent agent, independent of the information content. Uh, the genetic code's origin coincides with the origin of life, meaning that there's not enough time for the code to evolve. And even if there was enough time, given what Francis Crick argued, there's no way that the code could evolve. There are overlapping codes that exist within DNA that implies the work of an intelligent agent. And the genetic code is optimized to harbor overlapping codes. That implies intelligence. So what you can see is that there is a, a accumulating weight of evidence just from the structure of the genetic code and the information makeup of living systems to argue for the work of a creator and to argue against an evolutionary explanation.